The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? What's up, family? What's up? What to do? My name's Grant, clearly. Um, I want to share my story with you guys a little bit. Uh, one thing I want to say right off the bat is you guys really mess me up a lot. Uh, I know I'm a millennial. I've got to represent all this generation, which is getting a pretty good rap in uh, social media. And everywhere I go, people are just ranting and raving about how great millennials are. Um, <laughs> all right, here's a little bit about my story and how y'all mess me up. So I am Mexican. Uh, these are my cousins. And I'm also African American. Before you question how is that possible, my dad's from South Africa, so I'm technically African American. My dad's from the dirty South Africa, and I'm Mexican. Uh, but I ironically grew up, I can't speak any Spanish, I grew up with uh, predominantly with African Americans on a basketball team, and then something happened. I went to church and I got saved. And it was all white people at this church. Um, <laughs> I started wearing American Eagle, I started wearing Hollister, I started wearing tighter jeans with holes in them. I started going to the, the Second Christian Trinity, you guys all worship there probably in the last week if not to this morning. Uh, for the first time I went to Chipotle, never been there before. Me and, me and these guys didn't go to Chipotle together. <laughs> I finally went to Starbucks. We definitely didn't hit up Starbucks together. And I then went to the other part of the Trinity, uh, Chipotle, Starbucks, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, that was it, Chick-fil-A. How many of you guys have worshiped there today? Go oh, raise hands. Who's, who's been to one of the three? In the last week, who's been to one of the three? Last month, who's been to one of the three? Don't tell me it ain't the Trinity here in the South. So the other thing, that was the biggest, March 8, 2006, so about 10 years ago, I got saved and God just wrecked me. But the second thing that happened is I met you guys. And that's what I mean is I got discipled by that guy right there. Um, two weeks after uh, becoming a Christian, this guy calls me on the phone. He's just like, man, can I take you under my wing? I want to pour into you. And here's why it matters is I meet a lot of young adults that love God, but they never got discipled. And you know what's funny is it has given me a lot of experience, exposure to do things that I do not deserve to do at the age that I am. Um, just some things that I get to do with my organization initiative. And now I'm trying to train up disciple makers by bringing in guest voices. Uh, Mayor uh, Tom Leppert is this one of the video uh, pictures, uh, ironically, then another mayor. Uh, this is Bill de Blasio. I know some people don't like him because he doesn't like Chick-fil-A. <laughs> The connection. And then uh, even this is yesterday, uh, getting to speak. I just flew in from New York, uh, the Demos, and then that, that other guy. Uh, <laughs> my point is this, is like, y'all messed me up because I started getting to have conversations and see as a reference point, what do you guys care about? And most young adults, they don't get that. They get to grow up in a Lord of the Flies environment. Because they just surround themselves with young people. They go to school with young people. They go to church with young people. It's not helpful. Uh, Lord of the Flies, like, I think Piggy gets killed. I, I haven't read in a while, but I, there's a lot of, seven out of ten young adults are leaving the church. Now, here's how this is important to you guys in the faith and work conversation. Because what I want to do is I want us to disrupt division. I personally believe that we are in one of the most divided times. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that, turn on the news. But think about it. I just think that if you were in the enemy's shoes and you're looking at the church and you hear Jesus, who's always come through, he's always proven his word is infallible. Like, and he says, Jesus says, the gates of hell cannot prevail against my church. If I was the enemy, I was like, okay, I can't defeat the church. So what will I try to do if I can't defeat it? I'll try to divide it. And the enemy has divided us by race, denomination, by occupation. He's divided us by generation. He's divided us by all these different things. 
what I want us to do is what if we could start basically building trust between those different places and go back to, I guess, in being a family. I say, what's up, family? Because in 10,000 years from now, whether I'm a millennial or a different race, like we are going to be a family worshiping God together, no matter what your occupation, denomination, race, and all those things. So why won't we just be a family now? Why would we wait for that? So here's something I want to encourage y'all. I know millennials, like I said, they're really awesome and everyone loves them. Um, Here's, I got the drawing desk. I wish there was a millennial desk, but there's not. There's just a kid's desk, so I'm going to do the doodle desk right here. So first thing, how can we disrupt occupational division? I think that's the role uh, that you guys could really play into. Here is something from Ephesians 4.11 that I want to show you guys. Anyone seen this before? Apes, raise your hand if you have. It's apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Ephesians 4.11 said that God has given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to build up the body and equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You guys are familiar with the verse, right? Well, here's what I've noticed. Most pastors and staff, church staff, tend to be These guys right here, shepherds and teachers. We usually pick our church based on really, really great teachers. I haven't met the guy that says, oh, I go to this church and my teacher's terrible, but man, I love the place. Like, we pick it based off, especially here in Dallas, great communicators. If not that, then it's like, maybe he's not the greatest communicator, but he is an incredible shepherd. In fact, I would say our seminaries predominantly train up shepherds and teachers. This is nothing new to you guys. This is the whole conversation. Here's why this is also important. These guys tend to think, I think, at least from what I've noticed, event and Sunday morning, you guys, as I started to ask myself, okay, God, who are the apostles, prophets, and evangelists? By the way, if you have a problem with the word apostle, man, take it up with God, because I didn't put it in the Bible. He did. (laughs) Like... I'm not saying a capital A. I'm not saying we're walking with Jesus. Um, I'm just saying that's a word in the Bible. And with that, these, I, I noticed that the apostles, prophets, and evangelists you tend to be, like, who are the young, who are the leaders that apostle I usually saw as, like, business leaders? They're like Paul. They see problems, and they're always problem solving. They, they want an entrepreneurial networking. Uh, I think Paul is the biggest networker. He's always name dropping. He's like, pray for Phyllis, pray for, we all, I'm like, no one knows who these people are. Like, that's what networkers do is name people you don't know. Don't you know? No, I don't know. That's what networkers do. Prophet, this is the guy that everyone wants to kill at the end of the day because he reveals our heart. He says what's real, and it's like, man, that hurts. And we kill those guys a lot of times, at least historically, not today, I guess. And then evangelist, this is the guy that can't wait to get out and say, like, be around the lost. He's constantly sharing stories. And this is the person that wants to go out into the world. These guys, I just tend to be out in the community. By the way, Jesus did 41 miracles in his ministry. You want to guess how many were in the building of the temple? Dos. That's Spanish for two. That's, I know that. Two of his miracles were in the temple. The rest of the 41 miracles were out in the culture, in the community. You do not become a friend of sinners in a building. You guys know that. You're, you have the privilege to be, uh, be around uh, lost people, or as my group calls, future family. They're, they're just about to be invited in. Like, I have an expectation. They're future family to me. Um, why does this matter? I think that millennials are moving over to that APE, or some people would call them ape leaders, and I don't see a lot of people making that connection, is they are, thank God, tired of just going to an event on Sunday morning. They don't want to go to church as much as they want to be the church. Is that not, who who are you guys having this conversation about? They are having that halftime experience and trying to go from success to significance at 20 years old, and I would even say maybe 16 years old. Business Journal has found that 52% of millennials, not Christian millennials, millennials would take a drastic pay cut in order to have a job at work that would make a difference in the world. So they are not motivated by money. By the way, what their motivations are, we have a division of motivations. Young adults are not motivated by provision alone. And I think it's messing up the conversations from parents and business leaders. How do I motivate millennials? How do I incentivize them? Money. I'm not saying millennials hate money. Uh, I would, we can buy more skinny jeans. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which I'm wearing skinny jeans, proudly, whatever. Um, they are motivated not as much by provision. They are motivated by, I think, passion and purpose. 
you guys know these things, but this, what, how does this play out? How do I practically apply this? How many of you guys have a millennial as a grandchild or a child? How's it going for you? <laughs> Pretty good, I guess. I had to have a conversation with my dad where he, almost a year went by. I was like, Dad, I'm out of college, and every time you call me, I just know the conversation's going to come up where you're going to ask me about my money situation. Like, it, it, we can't ever just ask me about my passions or my purpose. It's always, usually the reason you instigated the call in the first place was because you wanted to talk about money. You want to talk about my future. You want to talk, which, if you've never heard a millennial, we'll do two things. One, I'm sorry that, yes, my generation is really dropping the ball right now. And you guys have given a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to give us the privilege to pursue our passions and our purpose. Uh, you guys had to, didn't have the, 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 the privilege to do that. You had, to, had the responsibility of just, I gotta do a job that I don't like because I gotta put food on the table. And, and thank you. Seriously, like, I am not who I am unless I had older people that invested in me and they had to make those sacrifices. Uh, two, I'm sorry that not every millennial thinks that or knows that or has appreciated that. Um, but they are, whether we like it or not, motivated by their passion and their purpose. And it reminds me of American poet, Dead Poet Society. I just watched it with Robin Williams like a month ago. And I'm, I'm watching him as he's teaching these kids and he's speaking into their passion and their purpose a ton in that movie. And I'm like, this is what's, this guy's like the favorite millennial teacher in a world that's trying to just train these kids to go to Harvard and go to Princeton and talking just about provision. And the dad that's like, Hey, kid, you can't, son, you can't go and do theater arts because I worked way too hard to get you this opportunity. And you know what happens? And whether it's happening in your kids or not, I would call it suicide of the soul. Is we're asking them to forget your passion, forget your purpose. It's all about your provision and you making it. And that's important. But it reminds me sometimes of the verse where it says, what does it matter if we gain the whole world and lose our own soul? And you got to ask yourself the hard question with millennials and in business, because these are motivators and they're cheaper than money, which is great. Um, would you be okay if your kid was fully provided for, they get to 40 years old, 60 years old, fully provided for, three, five times more than you were provided for. Like you killed it, which means you did good at, <laughs> at providing for them. But they never got to pursue their passions and exercise them for the glory of God, and they never got to fulfill their purpose that God had given them. But man, they were provided for. Would you be okay with that? Speak into, and what I say is, what if you could speak into their passions and their purpose and hear that for 30 minutes? I just don't negate anything. And then say, okay, you're, I'm, writing, I'm writing these things down. You're passionate about this. You're, per, you're passionate about accomplishing this. I usually ask, what do you want to accomplish in your life? Or if you don't get to do this in your life, you're, it would make you cringe. That's, that's close to the purpose. Um, what are the things that you can do for hours and most people just can't do that? That's some of your passions. What are the things you get excited about? What could you talk about forever? Um, these are some questions to instigate young adults' passion and purpose, and then say, okay, I've listened to you for an hour about this. I've written it down. You say you want to do these things. You want to accomplish these things. If you want to do this, you're going to have to get this kind of job. You're going to make, have to make this kind of money, and now we're going to talk about provision. Does that make sense? And now they're like, okay, it's, it's like when Jesus says, count the cost. We're starting with, you got to make all this money, and we're not really hearing young adults right now on their passion, their purpose. And I think that we are fighting the same fight when it comes to the goal, I think, should be right now, how can we get this to be one body? And whenever we're in a place where we need to be shepherded, we shepherd. Because one thing about business leaders is you guys are not sometimes setting the best example for young adults if you're bitter towards the church. You're not setting a great example if you're not affirming, getting involved, and even being patient and persevering with the church. Because I know that I used to have a problem with shepherds and teachers, which were predominantly shepherds, I mean the staff. And then I realized Ephesians 4.1, the beginning of that chapter said, walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. They are doing that. And we are doing, we're walking in a manner worthy of the calling in which we've been called. We have got to find a way that the APE leaders, the business leaders, the nonprofit leaders will stop being bitter, even if they have warranted bitterness, 
and say, I'm going to appreciate and pursue the local church. Because seven out of 10 young adults that are leaving the church, no one's talking about the seven out of 10 young adults that are joining social entrepreneurships, businesses, starting their own thing, nonprofits, causes, putting ice buckets on their head, whatever it may be, they will do that in a quick second. They're joining that. And if the people that are setting the culture are saying, hey, and you don't have to really care about the church, we're just going to go do our own thing. No, in the end of the day, it's going to hurt this next generation, the Z generation, because whatever you count and whatever you celebrate, that creates the culture of who you really are. Last thing, guys, I want to challenge y'all with 30 seconds left. Some of you guys, I think, are pretty bored. Non-Christians say that we're very bored. I would say that there's a lot of bored again Christianity going around in <laughs> X, Xers and boomers, and it's not compelling by, to young adults. I had a mentor of mine named Chad Hennings. He played for the Dallas Cowboys. He said, you may not be able to teach an old dog new tricks, but you can give an old dog a new purpose. And he said, I, got, I had a dog that was about to die. He was a slow, and I gave him a new puppy. And this passionate puppy that didn't know the world was just bugging the mess out of this dog, but the old dog like led him and showed him and guided him. And basically, the dog lived four more years. There's, I think some of you guys are bored because you are going and making an impact, but you're not going and making disciples. Making disciples means who is following you? And if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ and you can't say anyone's following you, John Maxwell would say you're just taking a walk. You call yourself a leader, but no one's following you. You're taking a walk. I'm asking you to, I want you to challenge you to ask three young mature millennial leaders that you've ever met and ask them who discipled you. Who mentored you? Who gambled on you? Who allowed you to fail? And if you see three in a row, say, they can mention not one, two, maybe even three guys, and you see there's a common denominator that every mature Christian young leader that I know was discipled, then you say, okay, I commit to discipleship. The Holy Spirit, I trust that he's going to show you three because I found every single young leader that I meet across the nation had someone that discipled them. It, I am who I am because your generation messed me up. So thank you.